Welcome to the Spectator Film Podcast. I'm Austin. And I am Max. And today we are talking about a big hairy gorilla. Don't talk about me that way. I'm trying <laughs> to lose weight, okay? I was actually thinking earlier that this movie is a great metaphor for like podcaster boyfriends and their <laughs> e-girl girlfriends. It's like this is exactly what this is like. It's just a big hairy guy. <laughs> Walking around, getting in, getting in the way of traffic, you know, causing a causing havoc and a, a ruckus, and then their girlfriend, um, who they're dragging along with them. But yeah, in case you couldn't tell already, the movie we're talking about is King Kong, ooh, nineteen thirty three original version. Oh, I thought we were doing the eight hour Peter Jackson one. Uh, oh man, I bet he's got a like a rough cut of that movie that's at least seven hours. Yeah, I brought, <laughs> I brought my PJs and everything. I was planning on having a sleepover to do this yeah. podcast. Jesus. But uh, no, um, I don't. I don't hate that movie as much as the others. Maybe we could uh, do that movie. If no, we were gonna... I. I genuinely like that movie. I... If we were gonna do that movie on the show, I would want to make it a live thing. We could raise some money for charity because, goddamn, that movie's long. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> we could turn it into a marathon thing or something. But I do enjoy it. Um, yeah, it's it's better than any of his Hobbit movies at the very least. At the very least, and also, I mean, I don't want to speak for you, but I think that your relationship with this original 1933 version kind of um orbits around the 2005 peter jackson version oh 100 percent. Well, yeah uh i when i was young i was fascinated with movie monster props and costumes and whatnot and it was something that drew me to a lot of movies the main one being like creature from the black lagoon and king kong was obviously one that if you're in love with that stuff you're going to come across but for whatever reason it didn't stick with me as much as some of those older ones did. And I didn't really revisit it until the Peter Jackson one came out. And of course I was already in love with Peter Jackson because Lord of the Rings, but upon rewatching it and at that age, being able to more appreciate the special effects and the just sheer amount of technical Marvel that they were at the time, and the amount of effort that went into them, I gained a greater appreciation for the movie. I'm still probably more of a, like Godzilla Kaiju fan more in general, but I think this movie has an important place in film history and it's definitely an interesting topic to talk about for more than one reason. Do you, do you think that you, I don't know, uh, drifted more towards like the creature from the black lagoon stuff uh, when you were younger, simply because this is like a monkey and you were like, I like the slimy lizard men. I think I, I, I think it was because the fact that the designs of like Creature from the Black Lagoon and like the Kaiju and whatnot, they were more intricate and more fantastical yeah. than just monkey. Yeah. I mean, we, in our, you know, entering into a maturity as a quote unquote adults, we can admire the form of the gorilla and say that what a majestic animal. I would love to see a massive gorilla. But it, as a kid, maybe you're like, I want to see a thing with like I just, a buzzsaw on its chest. I just that watched lasers. Pokemon and there was a fucking <laughs> yeah. thing shooting fire out of its mouth and a giant rock snake. This monkey is boring. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, but definitely in retrospect, you watch all this stuff and you're like, wow, this special effects work is really amazing. And that's definitely the big thing that I think has given this movie longevity is the work of Willis O'Brien. And that's definitely going to be a focal point of our conversation today. Um, that, I, that and the astounding amount of racism in this well, movie. Well, yeah. Obviously, the racism has aged incredibly well. Goes without saying. About as well as Cannibal Holocaust. But, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, no, this movie does have a much more like explicitly racist framework than a lot of the subsequent iterations of Kong. And I think that original framework and uh, sort of like imperialist adventure Perspective is going to be a big part of the conversation we're going to have today, but also maybe a, a big part of why this movie was such a big cultural uh, influence at the time. It's not simply the the amazing special effects, but the sort of mode of delivery for them in, in the way the story was constructed. So there's a lot of interesting stuff to talk about with that um, and, and the sort of evolution of King Kong um, as like a, a kind of like racialized other into more of a like recognizable kaiju that we the American monster, yeah, that we cheer for against human beings, um, even though that pathos is definitely buried in this movie. Um, it's like you watch Kong versus Godzilla now, which is part of the reason why we're doing this commentary because it came out recently. Um, but you watch that movie and you're like, yeah, I, d I don't care about you know the people. I don't give a shit about <laughs> Millie Bobby Brown and what she's doing. <laughs> it's like King Kong is like on a boat and it's like they've got him trapped and locked and like 
handcuffs or whatever. It's like, yeah, just fuck up the boat. Yeah. I don't care. Just just explode all of these military aircraft. You got to get out of there, King Kong. Just punch Godzilla get out in of the there. face. And yeah. You're, there's the, the... I care about them way more than any human being. Exactly. And that's the way it should be in those movies. Um, Watch Godzilla versus Kong. It's a great, dumb movie. But I again, my ultimate point is that I think it is an interesting evolution with King Kong specifically yes. from his origin point to that, to our audience relationship to him in that way. Um, for my part, I am sort of in a similar boat with you um, with this movie where I was obviously, you know, Lord of the Rings, big movies for me growing up, but uh, I was very much uh, anticipating the Peter Jackson King Kong movie, and uh, I was excited for watching all the featurettes and everything. I was reading like the Cinefix articles about the special effects, and that's when I also got into um, deciding to finally watch the original version. And uh, I got to say, it did not have very strong staying power <laughs> with me. I think I really preferred the uh, Ray Harryhausen versions of stop older stop motion animation. That was what made an impression on me. Stuff like Jason the Argonauts. This, I, it didn't take with me as much. It took me until I was like a teenager, until I really uh, started to appreciate all that stuff about this movie. Um, so yeah, returning to it now, obviously there's a lot of interesting stuff to talk about as far as the technology and the advancements in, in filmmaking. Um, there's also another thing we'll talk about is a lot of advancement in film music. That's a big thing with this music movie coming out in 1933. We're going to talk about it as a pre-code movie. And we are just going to talk about it again as like an imperial adventure. Um, there's a lot of things to go into there. And uh, I don't know. I think it's going to be a good episode. Either way, I think this is one of those movies where like certain elements of it has like transcended the movie. It is. K Kong himself has transcended his movie. So it is very much like Godzilla. Yeah. The fact that what Kong has become in the modern day now is so far removed <laughs> from the original message of the movie that it's it, interesting. In some ways, I think. Godzilla is responsible for it too. There's yeah. a reason why we call them kaiju movies. It's because like it's a Japanese word. They came up with this idea. It's Godzilla that pioneers this. And we'll we'll ask if this movie technically falls under the kaiju category yeah. and other hard hitting questions like if Clifford the Big Red Dog is a kaiju. But <laughs> yes. Yes. But until then, we'll I save that for the Clifford the Big Red Dog action scene in this. Yeah. <laughs> But Kong until rips then. his jaw off. Oh, God. Such a tragic <laughs> scene, really. But, yeah, are you ready to uh, jump into uh, Skull Island? King Kong or whatever, the Skull Mountain? Yeah. Let's go. <laughs> All right, let's go. It's an overture. Are we really sitting through the entire overture, Austin? It's part of the movie. Actually, when I was on the Wikipedia page for this, it had two separate run times <laughs> for it. And one of them was with Overture. So, it's the it's part of the movie we're watching. Oh, my God. Why? Why are we doing this? Well, I think this is a good opportunity for us to not only talk about the music, but uh, tell some jokes. Oh, God. So much <laughs> pressure on us. I mean, the music in this movie is phenomenal. Uh, if the special effects didn't already carry the movie, the music definitely adds so much tension to it. I will say one thing that is kind of like a joke, but not really, that I was thinking of while watching it for the show this week is like, it would be really funny if you played the movie straight, but instead of like, you know, the movie as it is, it's just like you get a boat full of gay guys looking for King Kong. Like the village people. Okay. I thought that would be really funny. The village people, yes. <laughs> yes. And it's just like, they just do what the village people do, trying to get King Kong. In the Navy. <laughs> yes. Oh, they got to bring King Kong to the YMCA so he can hang out with the boys and everything. I love how, like, willfully ignorant of gay people we were in the 90s that everybody was just like, yeah, they're just talking about having a good time. The YMCA. Time. It's grand old time. <laughs> Oh, that's amazing. Just some dudes being bros. <laughs> yep. The YMCA. The YMCA. Oh, um, man. Well, I have gotten a greater appreciation for the village people <laughs> as I've grown up. Them and ABBA, I'm just like, just keep doing you guys. I Especially like, the village people. Yeah. Any gay person who's like, uh, like from the 70s and 80s, it's like, well, you survived, number one. Yeah. 
Uh, and then number two, you didn't get like the shit kick- kicked out of you until you were like in a coma somehow. So uh, cheers to you. That's what I have to say. So cheers to the village people is really the reason we're watching this overture <laughs> sequence. But um, the real reason I think it's worthwhile to have this overture sequence is number one, to really capture the essence of what type of cinema cinema experience this is at the time. Um, an overture sequence for anyone who's not familiar with it is usually something that you're going to find in features of older movies. You really don't see it nowadays ever. Um, and it is a thing that would occur in as like a signal to people to get to their seats basically. And, uh, it would only happen with like really epic big movies. Those are the movies that receive an overture. And even though this movie is sub 90 minutes, I think it's appropriate that it has this sort of overture sequence because um, it really helps put you back in the mindset of what it would have been like to go see a movie of like this at the time. Whenever I think of like, I mean, this comes later, like the road shows and whatnot to try to make movies seem like a big thing at the theater. But like you see that stuff like it parodied in like Monty Python um, when they were trying to make movies feel like they did back in the 30s again with the road shows. And they would have intermissions and whatnot. Yeah. So like Monty Python and the Holy Grail famously has the whole just like incredibly tense scene and then just do 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 intermission bit. Yeah. Um. So it, it is interesting to see like older movies like try to emulate that theater experience and try to elevate film, which was still a fledgling art form at the time. To yeah. I think that's the thing. craziest thing about watching King Kong. We've yeah. watched some older movies on the show, but I think it's really interesting to look at this movie as like, this is really one of the first like like recognizable origin points for like what we would consider a blockbuster. Oh, 100%. It has so many of the ingredients in it. And uh furthermore, even though Willis O'Brien had been working on movies previ- prior to this that were, you know, featured their own kind of impressive special effects and everything and um this definitely isn't the first movie to have really intense special effects or even dumb monster action movies. Uh, or action scenes um it is kind of just like a synthesis of all those techniques into like a perfect expression of them like the special effects in this are really quite good um they really threw a decent amount of money behind this and then uh it was just a huge success like I, th- just historically there's prior to this not a lot of movies of this ilk i think no it it was truly one of a kind yeah um, there would be a lot of imitators to follow, but it, it, nothing really came close for a while. Willis O'Brien, when you get to be the mentor to fucking Ray Harryhausen, like, you know that you, <laughs> you were incredibly important. Ray Harryhausen actually devoted a good portion of his life to making sure people didn't forget him and the contributions he made to special effects, which is... Which is important because, as we discussed during our uh, Phantom of the Opera episode with uh, Lon Chaney and his uh, often overlooked amazing makeup techniques that we he would do himself, that's lost information now. Yeah. We, do, we straight up don't know how he did those things. We can only speculate, really, and go off of whatever available evidence or, like, uh, first-hand accounts of his techniques that people had. Um, so a lot of these really creative people from this time period, it is, you know, it it's really kind of special information to have access to um, about how they made all these really remarkable things. And straight up, Max, there are things in this movie that, like, none of it looks, like, comparable to today. But the in the technical proficiency of it, the way they achieve certain match cuts, the way they... Uh, synchronize um, rear screen projection with, um, you know, uh, sort of larger scale uh, props and sets, prop prop work, but also mechanical yes. work is like they're masterwork, masterwork. This movie, also as you pointed out to me, that is not an Arabian proverb. It's just something they <laughs> something they straight up made up. Because why not? Ah, people don't know Arabian. We'll just say a thing. It's just it's, it's, I bet some Arabian person said it at some point. We get this one scene where he's talking about how they have too much explosives, which is drawn out for an hour in the Peter Jackson movie. So many explosives. And uh, what do they have in the Peter Jackson one? They have a date rape drug, right? Yeah. (laughs) That's how they get King Kong at the end is they roofie him. They have chloroform. Yes. (laughs) Because it's an illegal animal, animal smuggling ship. I did mention to you that's, 
I think we mentioned this all the way back on our Dead Alive commentary from like 80 years ago. Yes. But the fact that one cute little detail I really like in Peter Jackson's King Kong is the fact that he references the, uh, what is it, the rat monkey. In what the, do they call it? The Zinvala or something. Yeah, but the, it's... Zingaya. It's something like that. But it's one of those things in like you see all the cages labeled and it's just like tiger and this and this and this. Oh, the Sumatran rat monkey. Yeah. Yes, that's what it is. And then you see its cage labeled and it's busted out of the cage. And I'm like, oh, OK, that's cute. I yeah. like that. So, Max, we instead of talking about uh, the actual music in the overture sequence, which we could have done, we talked about the village people. Um, but before was we, a, oh my god, look at that comical grenade! <laughs> yeah, that's like uh, that's like a cartoon bomb, but a grenade. Yes. Um, but uh, yeah, so instead of talking about the village people, I'm going to talk about the overture for this this movie. This movie is often discussed as being one of the most important um, early sort of sound films uh, in the U.S. and really a pioneer in terms of how film music would be used uh, to to hit certain dramatic cues and in different sc- dramatic scenarios going forward. Remember, this is an early blueprint for like most blockbuster movies. And a big part of that is the musical scoring done by Max Steiner, one of the best uh, classic Hollywood composers. Um, and uh, I, I part of the big, I'll include, you know, essays, l- links to essays and stuff in the show notes. But one of the big things about the music in this movie is the way in which it plays with the difference between diegetic and the non-diegetic sound. Um, Pretty much every scene does have a score of some type in it. However, you will notice in these precursor scenes, before they arrive at the island, uh, a lot of the sound and the music is going to seem as if it's more similar to what you would call a movie tone thing, where it's motivated by moments in the film and it's diegetic. And it's it's not like rhythmic in the same way that you think of a normal movie score. Um, and for anyone who doesn't know, movie tone and, and talky stuff was the interim between like silent film and like actual sound filmmaking, which arrived in the 30s. Uh, sound started 1927 with the jazz singer, but it wasn't complete sound yet. It wasn't what we think of when we think of sound film. Uh, they did a lot of like, artificial scoring of sounds where you know composers would would uh record noises and things that sync up with different parts of the movies that uh are meant to like simulate the sound of that thing so that's what you had as an intermediate stage in 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 brief basically movie tone stuff talky stuff was some recorded um person-to-person dialogue and then also like a simulation of real sound which would then become more advanced yes. with like VFX stuff, which is what we have today. Um, and again, King Kong is like a big point of departure for that because uh, we are now moving towards a uh, era of filmmaking where it's like, we can now just have people talk all the time and uh, we're actually going to, re- you know, utilize the score in a way that is going to focus equally on scoring things dramatically just like they did in silent films instead of just literally providing a sort of audio, um, a corresponding audio track to what's happening happening visually. But the thing is, it's a mix of both. So Max Steiner got very creative with combining music with those non-diegetic sounds. And a lot of it shows up later with the uh, combat scenes. If you listen to those you're going to see that there's a lot of like sounds that seem to mimic the uh, behaviors of what's happening on screen or the sounds of like the pterodactyl flapping its wings and stuff. It's pretty cool. So one other thing I just talked over, though, that I thought was really interesting this time around, and this was the first time I really appreciated this detail, is the sort of pre-code nature of this film. In that scene where they're talking about like, oh, I got to get a girl for my movie. You know, the public loves a romance, and I've got to get a girl to star in this movie. you got to find a girl. And then the guy who's the casting director of the movie is basically like, Carl, you're putting me in a shitty position, because i got to tell a girl to go on a boat with a bunch of stinky men for God knows how long. And they don't uh, know where. And they don't know what they're doing. <laughs> it's not a very good position to put a woman in. Um, but when they bring that up, 
there's sort of a veiled comment about like, seems to be discussing like the idea of like people perceiving what they're doing as like pornographic in some way or exploited, sexually exploitative. And it's a comment that's going to be echoed when Carl actually sits, sits, uh, and Darrow down Fay Ray here in her introduction scene, he sits her down and starts to talk to her about this idea. And again, there's that sort of implied, um, hesitance she has because she's like, I'm not going to be in a porno for yeah. you. And it's interesting to see the movie even make that type of gesture towards um, discussing that because it's like, wow, this 1933 movie is Pre Hayes code. talking about that. But the really interesting thing about it is that it looks about it in this scene specifically talks about that in reference to like Anne's economic distress as caused by the depression. Right. Um, there was a whole thing at the time about this idea of like fallen women in quotes, living in destitute situations who had to turn to sex work in order to survive the depression. And uh, I think this is sort of participating in that discourse. But I also think it's interesting because as we'll see, that form of um, the idea that sex work is like a very specific way of treating women as commodities is something that's going to be like contrasted with the way in which and is still treated as a commodity and like an object of exchange throughout the remainder of the movie. And she is just sort of like in this movie, she is just sort of a doe eyed protagonist that like doesn't have any impact on the story. And I'm, I'm re like, I'm remembering a lot of stuff from the Peter Jackson one now. Yeah. And it is like, they did go out of their way and people complain, Oh, it takes a fucking hour to get to the Island in that movie. At least they flesh out her wants and desires and interests in that hour. And like the only reason she agrees to go is because she likes the work of the person who's writing the screenplay for the movie. Yes. So at least we have like some agency on her part. It's because she has aspirations. Yes. Yes. Um, it's not just that she's like kind of like coerced and poor. Yeah. Um, which this, the movie expects you to take that she's genuinely excited. You know, it's not the implication that she's secretly hating this. Um, in fact, part of the silliness of this movie's take on gender is when she gets punched in the face in this scene, and she's like, oh, it's okay. <laughs> I'm sorry. She's enjoying herself too much, in my opinion. Um, basically, all her interactions with Jack Driscoll in this movie are pretty hilarious. Uh, there's a lot of funny scenes in this. Uh, I, I go back and forth on whether or not it's intentional, though. But Jack Driscoll is going to fucking hit her in the face here and then demand that she apologize to him for existing, I guess. How dare you exist next to me? Hey, old woman. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing on this boat? If you weren't on this boat, I wouldn't have hit you. Causing trouble already. I ought to hit you. With a woman. I don't think much of women in general. To get in the way. Don't worry, we're going to be a love interest by the end of this film for some reason. We only have gay sex on this boat. <laughs> I don't like having a woman around. It's not gay sex, Austin. It's male bonding. Right. <laughs> it's like what the Spartans did. <laughs> Do you think that uh, that steam whistle is a, a metaphor for sex? Yes. Once you start looking at this as a pre-code movie, anything is possible. Because pre-code movies were raunchy and they weren't they were like as clever as you would expect for a raunchy movie often. It's like stuff like that is like, I don't know if that's super clever. And that combined with the weird jokes, or I don't know if they're jokes. I don't know how aware this movie is about how funny it is, half this shit is. Um, I don't know if they're funny. I don't know if they're, it's jokes. Um, but st that steam engine cut is pretty conspicuous, you know? And it's definitely something that could be a metaphor for, you know, someone blowing their load or something so i don't know and obviously if we're talking about sex we're going to talk about it more later once kong actually shows up in the movie but that's just playing on the whole tried and true uh sexual paranoia of uh protecting white women from you know non-white people and yeah. black people specifically oh well that we yeah like i mean you have the natives in general and then like if you want to take kong as a metaphor for white imperialists bringing back something they consider exotic and chains to the U S there's a very poignant 
Yeah, it's slavery metaphor. For capitalist exploitation, yeah. explicitly. There's a very poignant anti-slavery metaphor to do that. But, like, the problem with that is this movie is already so racist that it's kind of hard to give it any credit there whatsoever. Well, it's not so much a matter of credit so much as... It, I We haven't talked so much about the man behind this movie. The major force is Marion C. Cooper. Um, and he made this movie with his uh, sort of creative partner... Um, Ernest uh, uh, Sean Beck or whatever his fucking name is. Uh, Ernest Sherbert. Let's call him that. Um, so they had made a few movies together previously before this. And they had made several movies in what was a, a pretty like prominent genre at this time. Uh, in, in the years pr- prior to this of like the ethnographic pseudo documentary film. I'm thinking of like Robert Flaherty-esque things like Nanak of the North. Right. If you've seen that, you know what I'm talking about, where in the early decades of film, uh, in the decades of film history, where it was still growing out of like a carnival fairground thing. Part of the part of the experience of that was people being able to see actual film footage of places they could have only dreamed of only a few years prior. You know, somebody born in 1870 in the middle of Missouri would probably never have any chance of seeing like, you know, uh, Beijing or some, or like Tokyo or someplace on the other side of the planet. But with film reels, you could see that. Not only that, you could see people in remote part of the world that barely anyone had ever visited. And no white man had ever seen before. Exactly. Right. And that's the very explicitly sort of imperial uh, sort of stance that a lot of these ethnographic documentary films take, especially when you consider that a lot of them, with Nanak the North being a very uh, you know prominent example of this, a lot of the stuff was staged, and it becomes this sort of like ethnographic fantasy. And it, when combined with that sort of fairground carnival-esque atmosphere in which it might have been consumed it sort of becomes like something that's uh, capitalizing on like ideas of exoticism and Orientalism, right? In order to uh, sell these films, see these, you know, distant cultures and and they're going to make them exotic and kind of like fetishize that in a specific way. Um, To be fair, I've not seen the previous work that Marion C. Cooper had done, but based on his biography, which is quite lively, um, he... (laughs) He aspired to be an explorer, and he did a lot of crazy shit. Um, But based on his biography, I would be willing to guess that he was, like, a fairly thoroughly racist person. Um, But under the guise of what I would call, like, liberal humanism, where his his racism is so taken for granted in terms of how the world works that he just thinks it's, like, a part of the universe, you know? It's unquestioning. And I think that's also a big part of this movie, where it's racism is is not so much malicious as it is like, no, this is just the way the world works. You know what yeah. I'm saying? It's almost like a it's like a Darwinian yeah. view of it, of just like, oh well, we've already started classifying all these animals and fauna that we encountered, so let's start to do it with people yes. and yes. different cultures. Yes. Even though Darwin specifically despite his own bit of racism and that he warned against using his theories against humans. But yeah, besides that, it's, it's very like the new, like you said, new liberal explorer mindset yes. of just like, we need to go out and see all the different human races and introduce them to our superior civilization. Cause obviously yep. we're the best and it's malicious in its obliviousness. Yes. Yes. That's, um, and of course we can't like admit the fact that like, they didn't just accidentally colonize all these places and extract marvelous amounts of wealth. Like, <laughs> why aren't these people more advanced? Why aren't they? Why aren't they in a developed country? Who did that? We're all like, trying to figure out who did this. The classic Eddie Izzard bit of the "Do you have a flag?" It's like, well, I claim this land for England. It's like, well, there's millions of us living here. What are you Where's talking? Where's your flag? <laughs> Do you have a flag? You can't have a country if you don't have a flag, according to the rules I just made up right now. <laughs> <laughs> yes. But uh, definitely Marion C. Cooper, I can imagine being like a self-styled um, person in that way where he would probably look at like things like the Empire State Building and look at that as like de facto evidence of like white superiority. You know what I'm saying? Where yeah. it's like, well, if these people like clearly we're the superior society because look at our fucking skyscraper. 
So that's the type of person that Marion C. Cooper is. Knock off Indiana Jones. Um, went to war against the Bolsheviks at, at the end of uh, World War One. So, and he volunteered for it. So what can I say? But uh, fuck you, and you're just embarrassing. What an embarrassing thing to do. <laughs> was he fighting like alongside like the White Army or like? He was in Poland. I didn't read into it well enough. I didn't know who he was fighting alongside, but I get the impression that he killed a decent amount of people because he was also an airplane pilot um, and an airplane bomber. (laughs) So he could have killed like a fair amount of people. So fuck you uh, for fighting the Bolsheviks. You're an asshole. Um, uh, You're like a a lame ass version of uh, Samuel Fuller. That's all you are. And I forgot why I brought that up. Oh, the ethnographic films. Basically, King Kong is is building on that tradition as well, where, uh, funny enough, much like <laughs> Cannibal Holocaust, is about a film crew going into the jungle to uh, uh, capture unfor- uh, hitherto unforeseen uh, events and peoples and cultures. Uh, very much fetishizing the eroticism uh, or the exoticism and kind of eroticism of, of those um, uh, distant lands and different peoples. Um, and uh, I think this movie, do you think this movie understands exactly how much of a like sleazeball exploitation filmmaker Denim is? Because Denim is very much self-consciously based on uh, Marion C. Cooper. He... To a degree, yes, but like it also goes out of his way, its way to like praise how great he is at every turn. Yeah, that's or, something that I like about the casting of um, Jack Black. Not to cut you off, but um, no, no and I would I would completely agree with that. Yeah, but like they always have caveats. They're just like, yes, you're reckless. Yes, you like don't think before you do these things, but you always deliver, and your pictures always make money, and you're truly the best at your field. And he's even if he does put her in danger throughout the movie, she ends up fine and they bring Kong back to and he never faces any fucking consequences for anything that he does. No, he says like, I'm Carl Denham to a cop after King Kong falls and destroys. I am assuming when he fell, he killed at least 10 people. Yeah. Um, he says it to a cop and you're just waiting for the cop to be like, Oh, well you're under arrest. Yeah. <laughs> this is your fault, but no, nothing happens. And again, that's why I like Jack Black in the remake. Yes, is Cause Jack Black is, like purposefully like you hate him well he you can tell he has genuine aspirations but he is a sleaze yes whereas with this movie it's like okay this guy is like this industrial sort of uh uh petty bourgeois kind of like entrepreneur he's very industrious right but the movie doesn't view that as wrong it views the world as simply not it is getting away from him this time you know like oh if I only didn't... he had better chains yes it was beauty that killed the beast. If only I didn't bring a fucking woman with me. <laughs> you know, like... It was the public's fault for wanting a romance. I would have been able to get <laughs> Kong if it wasn't for her. God damn it. Yeah, it's not... It's the fault of the situation is not lying with with him. And again, I think that's just speaking to Marion C. Cooper's general outlook on this whole situation and his own life, um, where he sort of felt like entitled to his role as a quote-unquote explorer. Whereas really he was just kind of like an imperialist. I was reading in his uh, sort of like just Wikipedia pages and everything um, that there was this one story of him where I, I think this is most indicative of his attitude where he seems like a genuinely smart person, Marion C. Cooper, and skilled and like very self, not self-aware, but like aware of his surroundings person, right? Very capable. But There was this one thing where, like, apparently he was, like, in Africa with this one tribe meeting with them about one thing or another because he would do this all the time. And uh, for some reason, he hauled off and smacked, like, the chief. And then when they were eating, the food he was eating was, like, laced with, like, bamboo barbs or something that would have absolutely killed him if not for the intervention of someone else there who was a doctor. Jesus Christ. (laughs) So it's like... There's a certain level of entitlement in that that I think it places themselves at like, you know, they can do no wrong, this type of person. And I don't think this movie uh, really uh, appreciates that about that character. 
But again, I think the story of King Kong is so interesting and more so than all the acting and everything. I think the great thing about Willis O'Brien that gives longevity to the like Kong myth is that his work has actually made the Kong performance the best performance of this movie. You cannot help but watch this movie so many years later and have a greater degree of pathos, admiration, and identification with King Kong because it is the most virtuistic and exciting performance. You are excited every time King Kong's on screen. You know, and then you see these actors and, you know, the performances are fine. Certainly, you think Faye Ray does a pretty admirable job. Yeah, 100 percent. Especially where Faye Ray, another pioneering thing of this movie, Faye Ray had to do that thing where actors interact with nothing (laughs) and pretend there's a giant monster there. I know we like to talk about that example with Ian McKellen uh, shouting at the Balrog when it's just like a bright light in his face. Yeah. Um, And that's obviously a really amazing example. But Faye Ray is doing it, you know. 70 years earlier she's doing the same thing in fact we just saw her sort of self-consciously do that um where she's screaming for carl denham on the boat there is something just unnerving about watching a bunch of white dudes get in a boat with all these guns to (laughs) this tribal village (laughs) we're just going to uh film some things Just, just peacefully it's fine we're here to spread democracy. And that's another thing. The fact that like, I know like, I don't think there's one specific culture that these natives are supposed to be based on, but like the shields are very reminiscent of like the Zulu shields. Yeah. And it's just like, uh... well, I know based on the original ideas uh, in the way that this idea for King Kong developed, basically uh, Marion C. Cooper saw another um, documentary type, movie about komodo dragons and he combined that with a story that he had always sort of returned to in his childhood a story about like giant giant ape people in the west of africa um attacking villages and kidnapping the women and he combined both those things in his mind um i did find out there's like a african cryptid that i heard about recently Of, like, it's supposed to live somewhere in, like, the deep jungles of the Congo that, like, we still don't know what's in there. It's Michael Douglas. It's supposed to be, like, a pygmy brontosaurus, basically. Like... Oh, the, like, Matolo Membe or something? Yeah. Yeah. They live It's somewhere in the deep rainforests of the Congo, which... Well, that's not real, but it would be cool if it was. No, it's one of those things that you're just, like... That's It's more plausible than the Loch Ness Monster, at least. (laughs) Loch Ness Monster is just bullshit. Yeah. That's the official spectator film podcast standpoint. It's just bullshit. It's just made up. Do you have a favorite cryptid just overall? I don't know. But now that you said the Loch Ness Monster, that is has a relationship to King Kong. Do you know yeah. why? Because one of the first major reportings of the Loch Ness Monster as like a plesiosaur-like animal came weeks. Actually, I think the report was made the same day uh, or the same weekend that King Kong played in Scotland. Oh, that makes sense. Isn't that funny? Yeah. Yeah. So King Kong, very important movie. All over the world. We also wouldn't have Mario without King Kong. But w- explain. Oh, you didn't what know this? What the fuck does... Th- is that what Donkey Kong is? Yes, King uh, Kong? Donkey Kong was supposed to be a King Kong game, but at the last minute, they couldn't get the rights, so it's Donkey Kong. And just like how uh, I believe Mario was supposed to be Popeye, as well they couldn't get the rights to that wait a second so their original idea was popeye fighting king kong yeah what happened to that movie i don't know but it is a cgi robin williams (laughs) a a lot of of nintendo's early ideas were just like we couldn't get the rights to this so we have to make up our own character now (laughs) (laughs) oh you can't get popeye let's just get a plumber or something yeah I mean, apparently, the, the the story is he was based off of uh, Nintendo's landlord. It was like this big fat... What, their, like, office building? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> is that real? Yeah. That's amazing. But also, that sucks. <laughs> so, Max, we've arrived at the sort of tribal performance ceremony. And you were talking about how this... this the sort of... um dress and costumes of, of this tribe seem to be a composite of many different peoples. And, and the th- point I was going to make about him uh, talking about uh, that story with the Komodo dragon is that, you know, 
obviously Komodo dragons are more of like an East Asian. Um, I don't know. I, there's an island called Komodo, yes, right? Yes, that's the only place they're found. Okay, yeah. Um, but obviously, if you were to look at the native inhabitants of that region, they're more of like a you know South Seas yes um, type of people, which we kind of talked about a specific type of racism towards that people in our <laughs> Island of Lost Souls episode, which is also a movie you could definitely compare to this. Um, I think Island of Lost Souls has a quite a more sophisticated take on race than this one does. Oh, one hundred percent. I also I, I just like that movie better than this movie, honestly. Like I appreciate this movie for its special effects, but yeah. I'll rewatch Line the Island of Lost Souls more often. It has than that them. Charles Lawton performance. Yeah. Yeah. And it's just it is really interesting to look at that movie where it's like, yeah, it's like race is a thing that's like engineered by white people and then like deposited onto other people. You know? Um But uh what was I gonna say? Oh so you know, I, I think it's a mixture of both of those things is that this island, Skull Island, is obviously somewhere in the Pacific. Um, but really trying to figure it out for sure is, you know, that's not really the point because the real point you should be picking up on is how this is kind of like a, a ethnic fantasy that's constructed for white people. And the reason why it's relevant to discuss this in reference to like Marion C. Cooper's whole career previously to this as like an ethnographic filmmaker is how much it sort of crosses those boundaries between uh, fact and fiction and documentary and fiction filmmaking in this film as well. Um, he's very much capitalizing not only on his own reputation and the really impressive success of those movies at the time, um, but also capitalizing on the sort of Orientalism, exoticism, racism that made those films a success in a more explicitly fictionalized context. And I think that's one of the primary ways in which this movie is like fundamentally ra like racist, you know? Um, because if you look at like within that, the depiction of them, I think it in that liberal humanist way, it does have a certain like appreciation for, and uh, I don't know, specific view of the different like tribal people we see here. I think you can, you can kind of look at that like witch doctor type character who is just consulting the chief as like kind of like a parallel between him and Captain Englehorn. So you have Denim and Englehorn, then you have the chief and then like his like, I don't know, consort or whatever. Right. And some of those parallels along with a lot of, there's a lot of parallels in this movie. There's a lot of binary oppositions. There's like the Island of Manhattan versus Skull Island. There's Kong climbing the Empire State Building versus climbing Skull, Skull Mountain. He's fighting the uh, plesiosaur versus fighting the uh, the elevated train, you know, or the pteranodon versus the airplane. And that sort of uh, those sort of binary oppositions work to create like a um, sort of equalization between both. Both the sort of uh, wild jungle and then New York. Um but baked into that is the exoticism inherent inherent in this. And uh, that's why, like, those attempts at equalization and humanization don't, like, really achieve anything. Because they're just overwhelmed by, like, the spectacle of these black people living on this island. And the spectacle of them stealing a white woman. Uh, yeah. I mean, Kong in general sort of epitomizes that fear later on in the movie, but it's, <sighs> this movie has two layers of that, which is truly just, uh, I don't know. Yeah. It, it truly is the beginnings of like what we would understand as like a more of like a modern liberal attitude towards race, right? Where there's a fundamental lack of acknowledgement about racism going on, but like, there is within that framework like an attempt to view view people as like you know other subjects um just without any sort of respect you know it's very much that mindset that we were talking about with Marion C Cooper previously yeah. also this scene is fucking hilarious jack just driscoll just walks up to her i guess i'm in love with you and what does she say she says but jack you hate women <laughs> that's a line from the movie and again, Max, I have to wonder, was that intentionally a joke? Is that meant to play as a joke? I mean, I think it's supposed to 
play as a joke in like the playful banter way of just like, oh, you like me? I thought you didn't like me. <laughs> I thought you hated women. <laughs> but I don't but I don't think it's <laughs> I don't think it's played in like a joke in the way that like we would find funny today. I disagree. I think it's meant to be played seriously. Jack, you hate women. It seems like a Mel Brooks line. <laughs> Jack, you hate women. Yeah, I know. <laughs> but you aren't women. You're a man. His response is hilarious. Yeah, I know. <laughs> what the fuck? That's how to, just so how to win any girl's heart. That's so fucking funny. The original, I'm not like, <laughs> you're not like the other girl. You're not women. <laughs> Jack, you hate women. Yeah, I know. <laughs> oh, God, that's amazing. That's so fucking amazing. Stop kissing the girl. You've got to kill, kiss me. Fucking no chemistry. And then at the end of the movie, it's just like, oh, they're about to be married in a couple of days. Yeah. But no, I, Max, I think that movie, it's so hard to tell, but I think maybe that was played for comedy. I certainly don't buy that it was like sexy, like romantic banter where it's like ironic why you hate women. Um, which, by the way, has any woman ever said that to you? That would be hilarious. No. Why you hate women? <laughs> no. <laughs> It's like a romantic banter thing that's just like still the funniest fucking thing to say. That's the like I I think that's the 30s intention of this though. Also, the fact that like they were chased angrily off the island, I you think they would have at least one person with a gun on watch and not just leave her dream. You think you'd think they would have just shot them to begin with. Yeah. But I guess you need them for the movie. You're getting in the way of our picture. We already got <laughs> the film of the ritual. Now get out of here. That's what I honestly like. The fact that they kept the natives alive, like when they're just like, make sure they don't close the gate. Like I thought they were just gonna fucking mow them all down with the guns, and it's like, okay, now we can close the gate and open the gate whenever we feel like it. Yeah, and then they film it, and they're like, this is awesome. Yeah. They attacked us. There's nothing we could do. Our brave sailors fended off attack by these savage natives, and it's like, yeah, uh, they pull the uh, the old taken routine. They use the uh, theft of a white woman to. Justify so. massacring tons <laughs> of people darker than them. Yes. That, again, is another big part of this movie that I think is probably one of the big things that, like, maybe on a subconscious level resonated with audiences is that, like, sort of instinct of using... Because it's something we see constantly, not only mo in movies, but just culturally in general, is, like, the... When there's a... Uh, this sort of, like, um, protection of, like the white female body as like a pretense for like incredibly harmful and, and horrifying racist violence. Right. It's just a, a thing that happens constantly, which is again, just going back into the, if you want to look at the racism of King Kong himself, like the idea of that excessive monstrous masculinity, I mean, yeah, come on. Uh, also I know cigarettes were free back then. Like they just gave them to you constantly. Yeah. Like, the amount of fucking cigarettes I've seen Jack just throw away when they're like half done is truly alarming. I'm, I'm very mad at him. Well, he's making sure to pollute this place pretty good. Yeah, you got it. <laughs> Let them know the white men were here. This is how you display dominance. Is you throw cigarettes in their face. You know, I once had a fl cigarette flicked at me. Philadelphia. No, oh, okay. That makes sense. I was sense. there for a conference. And then uh, I, th I think I was wearing like a Boston Celtics hat or something. And the guy was like, big luck out there, big guy. And he flicked a cigarette at me. <laughs> Crazy black man been here. Ooh, from the racist Asian cook, too. Oh, this is just... When you say racist Asian cook, what do you mean? <sighs> you mean racist depiction of an Asian cook. Yes. Right? Yes. I did, maybe the cook himself is also racist. But what is truly clear is that you know the movie holds him in very even though like like you could he's he's nice to the woman without like being a peeping tom glaring eyes toward her. he's just like uh, i'm here to fucking chop potatoes and well i mean nowadays 
Nowadays, the relationship between her and Jack Driscoll is the most alarming and bizarre. Yes. The first moment they have together, he punches her in the face and it just gets worse from there. <laughs> so watching it with these 2021 20, eyes, you, you look at Charlie and you're like, I like you. You're yeah. pretty good. Um, you're just peeling potatoes. Yeah. I mean, Charlie's... He makes, he makes a comment about how he doesn't fucking want to be here anymore. And he just wants to go back to China so he doesn't have to keep seeing all these fucking potatoes. I'm like, yeah. Yeah. I feel you, man. You and every Irish person. <laughs> Gotta go to China, escape these potatoes. Now, one thing I'm really interested about is, like, the marketing campaign for King Kong. And I was not able to successfully dig up a lot of information about this at, you know, with this, you know, preparation schedule that we have. However, I would really be curious to see whether or not this was like marketed along the same lines of, uh, Marion C. Cooper's prior films. Because again, those were, those were literal ethnographic documentaries. And we talked about comparing them with like Nanak of the North and how a lot of that is just fabricated and staged for the camera. So obviously it's not like a real documentary. However, in terms of how the like audience is, is concerned and, and how they're consuming it. I wonder if the advertising for this really tried to play up that angle. Yeah. And the connection to those things. Well, cause at the end of the movie you have like, I guess what are supposed to be like the stand-ins for the audience of this movie talking about just like, Oh, I've seen all of his other pictures and I don't want to sit as close to the screen. And at the end of the opening credits, we have, like, after all the stars, it's like, oh, we are also starring King Kong, the eighth wonder of the world. So it's, like, it's almost a commentary in, on itself on how it's supposed to be viewed. Yeah. But I don't know. It, it, that would be interesting to see. I would say that's the second really big, like, unintentional... Not the second unintentional thing, but this one is unintentional compared to King Kong himself. The thing that really gives this movie a type of like longevity is the idea of that mo film within a film process because it makes it so much more layered and interesting to discuss in terms of like an imperial project. There's so many lines of Jack Denham being like, or uh, Carl Denham talking about like, you know, conquering things with this camera. Maybe a movie that we've talked about before in the show that we could compare it to is Scooby Doo. On uh, Zombie Island. Oh, yes. Because what classic film. It is great, that movie. And one of the things we talked about with that movie is that kind of like post-colonial attitude that it has. Um, the idea that Daphne has become like a news investigator, news reporter. And she's going around to different haunted locations around the U.S. with a camera to try to collect a lot of information. And, you know, sort of do a documentary footage type thing to, for her hit new like TV show. And uh, it does remind me of the same sort of approach to this, where it's like this sort of like hegemonic Western gaze trying to, through the image of the camera, capture and control and dominate uh, the subaltern culture. Of course, this movie sort of brings that up deliberately, but it doesn't phrase it in those terms, you know? That's the interesting thing about this movie is that it phrases it in completely different terms while bringing those same things up. Instead of considering that whole process of like the imperialist filmmaker going to these cultures and capturing different things um, and like, you know, again, asserting their uh, agency over these different people and how they're depicted and uh, how they're going to be displayed to the rest of the world. Instead of looking at that as like an imperialist project, this movie views that as like a natural occurrence. It naturalizes that. It says it's part of the natural world. It's bound to happen. It's going to happen. That's just the way the world works. And again, another example of the parallels, we have Anne Darrow... Uh, Obviously, this is like the start of her uh, multiple exchanges between different parties in the film where she's kidnapped by the uh, tribe here. And then they're going to exchange her to uh, King Kong. But um, if you look at the ethnographic sort of like, you know, tribal ritual spectacle, the racist spectacle of them dancing and chanting, 
um, as its own type of spectacle compared to like King Kong. It you could also almost view it as like the tribe putting on a show for King Kong. Yeah, you know, there's multiple different ways you can view the idea of spectacle in this movie, and that's part of why it's so interesting. But speaking of spectacle, here's the real, here's the arrival of the real reason why this movie is great. Here he is, King Kong. Ooh, he. He's so cool. So King Kong is a mixture of stop motion animated uh, miniatures, very cleverly mixed into foreground shots through uh, rear screen projection. And then also there's a number of different moments where he's like a full scale mechanical model. Yes, they have, from what I understand, they built two full scale arms and a head. Yes. Um, for this and they they do transition back very flawlessly for this time like obviously you can tell when which one is being used just because like rear screen projections have that effect but they got the head to look very very similar to the miniature to the fact where you can cut back and forth between them and it looks very that's good. that's part of the really impressive thing and that's something we're going to stress with all the special effects in this movie pretty much um Oh my God, I have to talk about this moment right here where she falls off the pedestal. Yeah. Um, so what we're going to talk about with a lot of the King Kong special effects and why these special effects are so good despite obviously being from 1933 um, because it doesn't literally look real. You know? It doesn't literally look real, but it all looks very consistent. Um, and that's the real reason why this is a masterpiece of special effects work is because they developed all these techniques to make the special effects incredibly consistent and uh, like um, very much capturing the idea of what they were going for. Like I, I see King Kong in this and I'm like, wow, this is like a fleshed out character visually. Like I fully understand the concept they were going for with this character, with this image of this gorilla, you know? Fun fact, I, I know I mentioned this to you the other day. But uh, they had to chain Kong, change Kong's design from that of an actual gorilla because they thought the belly and the buttocks, to quote <laughs> him directly, looked too uh, comical. Yeah. So, so they had to smooth out a gorilla's figure in order to make him look intimidating. Because gorillas do have big pot bellies and they yeah. do have gigantic asses. I All I can tell you, though, is uh, in my own opinion, that makes them more scary to me. Because yeah. it's like... There, it, like, if you see, like, a gorilla that looks like a fucking bodybuilder, you're like, this is stupid, you know? But, like, a normal-looking gorilla, it's like, they're just fucking big. Yeah. <laughs> no, gorillas are absolutely terrifying. Yeah. And this is somebody whose favorite animal is, like, hippos who kill more people than the other animal in the world. That being said, Max, if I had the ability to do it in a way that wasn't the gorilla would let me, if they would enjoy it, I would love to give a gorilla a hug. Yeah. You could, like, meet Coco the gorilla or whatever. Because you know they would accept one, maybe. I did watch a cute little quip. Yeah, it came up on, like, Twitter feed of uh, when Coco met uh, Mr. Rogers, and she was just utterly ecstatic because she would watch Mr. Rogers every day and would always... She made him, like, take his shoes off when he came <laughs> because he always took his <laughs> shoes off. That's adorable. He kept. Hu- she kept hugging him. She was so happy to have Mr. Rogers there. Yeah. That's the other interesting thing about just gorillas in general is that I think at the time of the re- release of this movie, um, gorillas had only really been documented by white people, I think, like fucking 20 years previously. There's a lot of white gr- people didn't encounter gorillas until like 1910. There's so many animals like that, which like it blows my I've been watching a lot of nature documentaries recently just as like a thing in the background. That's nice to have. Yeah. And there was one about these like tiny little kinds of spiders called pelican spiders, which they look really fucking cool and alien. But we encountered them first in amber and we thought they had been extinct for as long as the dinosaurs had. And then just, I believe it was like, it was sometime in the 1900s. We just found them living in South Africa and Madagascar of just like, oh no, they're still hanging out. They haven't changed in millions of years. And it's so amazing that we can still find these like pockets of animals we thought were gone for fucking forever. Despite our best attempts to destroy them. Yep. Yeah. And also the stegosaurus work is pretty amazing. Do you know the official name for the 
club tail of a stegosaurus? Well, it's not a club. But you know what I it's mean. It's a spike tail. The spike tail. Do you know what the official name is? Yeah, cock. No, it's the uh, thagomizer. The thagomizer? Yes. Holy shit, that's great. You know where that comes from? Where? A far side comic. Um, there is a far side comic where it's like cavemen and like learning about the anatomy of a stegosaurus. And they're like this, and this part is the thagomizer named after the late thag. And, <laughs> <laughs> and paleontologists, like, they didn't have an official name for that yet. So <laughs> they're just like, you know what? No, that's yeah, I was fucking gonna say, great. Definitely Stegosaurus predates Far Side Comics, but that is a great name. Yeah. Thagomizer. <laughs> Speaking of the Stegosaurus, this shot is really incredible. Part of the big technological advancement with this movie, um, now it's a little bit janky now that they're walking, but whatever. Um, part of the really impressive thing with this movie and the way it constructs its sets and everything is its use of rear screen projection. Now, prior to this, rear screen projection used to be like much more obvious. And uh, uh, basically, like they had to develop a whole new like technique. I forget the guy's name. Um, they had to develop a whole new technique that basically when they finished developing it for this movie, they, uh, they were able to do rear screen projection with like a lot more fidelity to the image. So there was less of a bright spot in the center center of the image. Yeah. Um, less of a highlight that made it obvious that this thing was rear screen projected. And there was a lot less of a light fall off around the edges, which really made it work. And then a lot of the really intricate special effects work in this is just, they would set up these massive, um, not massive, but like they would have these, sets that they would build and then they would have uh film screens that then they would project on and uh they would often create the sets that you see by projecting a lot of different uh images onto different parts of their set and it's really quite seamless the way they did it i mean they just did an overall fantastic job with this stuff and I also really appreciate the sort of structural decision to save all of the special effects and sort of pyrotechnics in quotes um, for this part of the movie. Uh, this is one of the you know earlier big movies in no- notable producer David O. Selznick's career. Um, obviously, he would go on to be one of the biggest producers in Hollywood of his day. Um, uh, but when they were making this movie, he originally was pushing for King Kong to be revealed in like the first five minutes. He's like, you got to have Kong right away. And uh, one of the good decisions that was made by uh, Cooper and uh, Schumbeck was um, to be like, hey, we're going to build up to Kong. We're going to save it for later. Yeah. It's like, um, I'm not, I'm, there's no steadfast rules in filmmaking. Like, rules are there so you can break them but it's very rare if you're going to have a prominent monster in your movie to it's rarely a good idea to show that monster very early on or even hint at them like our first ever available commentary is predator and that movie you could make that movie much better by cutting 10 sec like 10 seconds of that spaceship fucking not come down to earth in the beginning that would have been totally like radical and bizarre yeah and and totally people would have been unprepared for it but yeah but i think it would have been better this uh this uh brontosaurus creature was a uh mechanical piece by the way when it first sticks its head out the uh water again the combination different things Speaking of uh, combination, oh, you're saying the rag dolls that he throws out of his mouth later aren't real people. No, unfortunately not. Um, but one of the things I wanted to comment on a previous scene when King Kong takes Andero originally, one of the great sort of special effects tricks that you see um, and really right in your face is that sort of like special effects switching. You might call yes. it. Um, and you know what moment it reminds me of uh, the. It reminds me of the, the moment of like the T-Rex showing up in Jurassic Park. There's a scene once the kids turn the flashlight on and they start annoying the T-Rex with it. Uh, the T-Rex is nudging Jeff Goldblum and Sam Neill's car with its nose 
and then the light turns on and it lifts its head up, right? Now, when it's nudging their car, that's the Stan Stan Winston uh, mechanical T-Rex. And then... Yep, and then it leaves, its head leaves frame as the light distracts it, and then it walks over and it's CGI. And having the thing physically in the frame as a robotic first really sells the transition when it's walking because it's still the same shot. We're not cutting. It tricks your brain. Yes, and that's exactly what they did with Andero, where on the pedestal she breaks out, but she falls down and she falls out of sight. And um, that's the live action she falls out of sight, and then when she's picked up by Kong, she's uh, stop motion animated. Great, great scene. Also in Jurassic Park, I love that that whole bit because you know the part where the like the kids are screaming because the T Rex is push, pushing like the sunroof down. Yes, I love this. The fact that <laughs> that wasn't supposed to happen, nope. and the kids were <laughs> utterly fucking terrified. And also because that giant T Rex is hydraulics, and because it notoriously was not working properly because of the rain, it would Steven like come Spielberg to life has randomly. The worst luck with the fucking. <laughs> Yes. animatronic monsters he <laughs> fucking makes. But I just think, like, if you're one of those kids and you know that animatronic T-Rex has been malfunctioning because of the rain, like, animatro- like hydraulic T-Rex thing, it basically, the way it moves is you program coordinates, right? So it's going to reach that point no matter what. That hydraulics could kill you so easily. Oh, yeah, especially with those fucking sharp teeth in there. Yeah. So, uh, you know, like... Those kids still could have died, and that's amazing. Monkey, monkey. Here he is. Oh, man, I love him. I do love that in uh, Kong versus Godzilla, they have, like, one throwaway away line of why he's the size of Godzilla now. Where they're just like, oh, he's still been growing. And I'm just like, oh, okay, cool. He's been drinking his milk. Whatever. I don't care. I'm watching Kong versus Godzilla. Yeah, no one cares. It doesn't matter. Well, because that's the thing you always see brought up. They're like, if it's the original King Kong, then Godzilla should win easily because Godzilla is the size of the Empire State Building and Kong can climb it. So, blah, 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 blah. There's two different versions of King Kong. And I think the uh, the fact that there's two different versions, again, speaks to, like, the longevity and prevalence of, like, the character. It's evidence that he's a great character that there's two different versions. By the way, have you ever seen the uh, Ishiro Honda directed uh, King Kong versus Mecha King Kong? No, I haven't. I I know of it, and I know Mecha Kong looks fucking stupid. Yeah, he doesn't look as cool as Mecha Godzilla. Yeah, any but of it. it is interesting that Mecha King Kong predates Mecha Godzilla. Yes, you'd think it would be the other way around, but not really. In this scene, this was supposed to be. People remember the infamous bug scene from the Peter Jackson King Kong. I believe that was also cut. Partially. Yeah, it was caught partially, but yeah. there was supposed to be that idea was taken from the original script from this, and it was just like a special effects thing they couldn't get working. They wanted like a bunch of gigantic bugs down there. See, no, that footage exists. From that what, footage exists of the bugs. From what I understand, Peter Jackson tried to recreate that scene with that, and that's the scene that exists, but I could be wrong. So the when they cut it out. It was because of a preview thing, because I think people were like shocked by the big monkey and whatever, but like they were like big spiders are just, this is just no. And uh, there was, and I think the thing was like they cut to a specific close up of a guy's head being like just chomped off by a spider. And people did not like it in the preview. Uh, I think the thing was that they said that the special effects went too far. You know, it was like, okay, this is upsetting people. (laughs) So we're just going to have this. Okay, well, I've only ever seen the Peter Jackson uh, recreation of it. I've never seen. I've never seen the original footage either. I don't know if the footage has survived. That's the thing. Yeah, Yeah, but I, I, I do believe they shot it and had it in that preview. Because that was like that wasn't even going to be in the movie. That was just like Peter Jackson being like, I have all this money. Let's do this thing because why not? Yeah. You know, I'm glad he got to make the movie he wanted to make. Um, there's a lot worse choices to, you know, for, for like your big payday after your huge success movie for what to make instead of like a King Kong remake. That's a fairly decent choice to go after. It's pretty ambitious. And it's a fine movie. It really is. It's, it's a, not the best movie. It's not the best movie, yeah. but it's fine is what yeah. I'm saying. And I'm not going to complain getting new versions of King Kong. I'm sorry. I'm just not going to be upset about that. And like after seeing like 
what movies he make to when he really doesn't want to be making a movie. Yeah. Like the Hobbit movies. Like you can tell he actually cared about King Kong and wanted to make that movie. Yeah. Sometimes to its detriment, but you know, that's its own conversation. Yeah. Um, we'll, we'll do that in our 201st episode. <laughs> he should have brought in Mecha King Kong Mecha is what Kong. we're saying. Yes. Yeah. And son of Kong and Frankenstein's Kong. A mighty Joe Young. The beast of hollow mountain. Mighty Joe Young. Shout out to Mighty Joe Young. Shout outs to the Beast of Hollow Mountain. Not the remake of Mighty Joe Young. I yeah. don't know anything about that. I saw it as a kid. I don't really care about it. But the original Mighty Joe Young also features guerrilla work by Willis O'Brien. Yes. Only it's 15 years later, and he's gotten that much better at his craft. Speaking the- of his craft, this scene in particular, which I'm, I don't want to speak for you, but this is a remarkable achievement of stop animation. This scene in particular took seven to eight weeks to film, and I believe you mentioned to me that certain crew members had to stay 24 hours just for yeah. consistency. So, like, you're talking about the stop motion part of it. Yeah. Also, the the reference stuff and the work with uh, Fay Ray in the uh, foreground, I think uh, that they shot for, like, 24 hours straight trying yeah. to get the shit right. Because also, again, we're talking about the different levels of special effects integration in this movie. Uh, this tree that Fay Ray is on is mechanical. And when King Kong knocks into it, it's supposed to move around and like fall down. And instead you see it like cut away as it starts to fall down because the mechanics of it weren't just weren't wor- working properly. But still, you get a good idea of what's happening. And this girl, so King Kong is about to knock into it. You can see Fay Ray is a real person in this shot. That girl up there, though, is a uh, stunt woman. Yeah. You ain't you ain't putting your dame up there. <laughs> your woo-woo, uh, to quote <laughs> Marion C. Cooper, one of the weirder bits of trivia I found. Um, so one of the things I did researching for this movie is I, uh, I watched the 1984 Criterion commentary for this movie, for their laser disc commentary, which I don't know if we mentioned this already, the first commentary track of all time. Yeah, you was did. For, okay, yeah, yeah. That was recorded by the Criterion Collection, their laser disc edition of this movie. Now, the guy on that mo- commentary track had some weird things to say about Marion C. Cooper. <laughs> One of them was that Marion C. Cooper in this movie kept looking for what he called a woo woo. Um, which he meant as like a woman who would go woo woo whenever the romantic lead male said anything. And I don't understand that at all. I, I have no idea what the fuck he's talking Austin about. And then I both interpreted it as like the modern cringe. Ooh, yes. <laughs> Cat face. But yes, that, it's like this movie predates weebs. So I'm not sure what he meant. <laughs> Mary C. Cooper into anime or something. Um, no, like I, I, I have no idea what to make of that, and I don't really want to know what he meant by that. Really, nothing good. Nothing good can come of us knowing what he meant by that. Everything I look into Marion C. Cooper is like you wanted to be like a gentleman explorer, but you're really weird. So yes, Max, that's why they would use a stunt woman for that is because they had to protect their woo woo, Bay Ray. Now, in a less ridiculous way, maybe we could praise Fay Ray for her uh, performance here. She is the most believable actress in the or actor in the movie in general. Yeah, she, she does show a wide breath breath of emotion rather than I want to make my movie or I got to save my dame. Yes. So, and uh, you know, not easy to. She gives a much more physical performance. Yes. Than uh, a lot of the other actors, she's screaming constantly. And uh, I mean, to be fair, she's being assaulted by various nightmare creatures. So, oh, sure. I'm not I'm not holding it against her. Um, I don't know if those are actually her screams or if they're recorded by someone else or what the deal is with that. But certainly she sells them pretty well. Um, I just think it's impressive to look at this style of performance, though. Again, we can compare it to Ian McKellen facing down the uh, Balrog. Um but I think, you know, for a long time, people would probably look at this performance with Faye Ray and think it's some sort of like silly bullshit. But like before this, did any human have to interact with like a non-existent character yeah. in this way? Is she really the first person to have to do this on this scale? Pr- 
probably right. I can't. I can't think of any because we're gonna say yes, and then of course somebody's gonna be like, "Well, actually, the the movie invasion of this thing predates this by two months and was released in Germany for two weeks." But um, yeah, it's also a matter of scale. Yeah, it's like this is a huge movie, huge released movie. Oh man, look at that depth. That's amazing. Um, but no, I think it is, you, you do have to acknowledge that this is a landmark performance in film history. Um, even if, you know, you think the movie is silly or just like a stupid B movie thing, um, as I'm sure it was dismissed as throughout a lot of the 20th century, uh, you do have to acknowledge that Faye Ray is acting with a counterpart that is just not there. I don't think she would have been able to just see the stop motion animated footage you know, yeah. and even still, it's not like she has like a real reference point for the fucking thing there. Maybe they could show her the prop face if it existed at the time when they were filming. Or maybe it was, you know, uh, really far away in uh, Willis O'Brien's workshop, wherever the fuck that was. You know, we don't know if they were filming. They just showed her a photo of a gorilla. I'm yeah. Like, imagine if this was big. The only part of the gorilla we know for sure that she would have interacted with is the hands, right? No, well, we do see her in its teeth at one point. Okay. So that's at the end of the movie, though. I don't know what order they shot the shit in. But. but the point is she consistently managed to manages in her own performance to help sell the reality of King Kong himself. She's equally important to yes. bringing the character to life. Do you have a favorite version of King Kong? The one we haven't talked about so far yet is the uh, Jeff Bridges, Jessica Lange, 76 version. Sorry? Do you have a favorite version of King Kong? A favorite version? Um, yeah. I mean, this is classic, and I am a sucker for stop animation. Uh, Peter Jackson's one did expand the character depth of it. Um, Skull Island and... Godzilla versus Kong. They did add a lot more depth to Kong's character and in a way that feels less like 1930s cheesy. It's still dumb. Like, yeah, it's an axe body spray movie. Yes. Yeah. I, th I liked that movie in the same way. I liked Aquaman where I'm just like, fuck yeah, I don't care. This is dumb and I love it. But at the same time, it's, I don't know. It's definitely not the Toho <laughs> King Kong, the one that can eat electricity and grow stronger. So but, is that your favorite iteration? No, I said that's definitely not. My <laughs> oh, okay. So you don't like the original Kong versus Godzilla? N no. It is kind of amazing it took them like 60 years to do another one. Yeah, like that movie, I like the idea of it. I love the big like East versus West, like let's get our big monsters to fight. But like, like a lot of... Those Toho Kaiju movies, like, and listen, I watch Gamera movies. I know, like, movies can be bad and I can still enjoy them. But, like, <laughs> if you watch Gamera movies, you know, yeah. movies can be bad. <laughs> yes. But, like, I can still enjoy them at the end of the day, is the thing. The point is not the individual Gamera movies, it is the whole mythos. Yes. And that's the way it is with all Kaiju movies. That's the way it is with a lot of pulp genres, right? It's like you. It's not about the individual thing. It's the milieu of all of them collected together. Exactly. Yeah. But um, I, I King Kong versus Godzilla is not one of my favorites. Um, you mean the sixty two? Yes. Ishiro Honda one. Yeah. Honestly, like I, I think it might be like the Skull Island Godzilla versus, yeah, King Kong new one because like yeah, they they did give him a lot of emotions and pathos. And like, even though I was rooting for Godzilla in those movies, cause I'm more of a Kaiju fan. Like he was undoubtedly the hero and main character of Godzilla versus Kong. Um, and although I like the 2005, 2006 one, it's not very portentous. Yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a very self serious movie. Um, it does have funny moments, but yes, it is very like, and I will say, while while I do not share a lot of the complaints about people being like, it takes them so long to get to the island, because I do appreciate a big buildup like that, um, I think I think they spend too much time off the island at the end. Yeah. You know? They, like They really expand the fucking New York scene, which, like, 
I get it's it's an interesting idea to have like this gigantic monster running through the city. It's why the kaiju movies take off so well. But like you can't have this big melodramatic adventure and then just like turn it into that at the last 45 minutes of the movie. It is a long movie. Yeah, it is long. It's okay that it's long. I just think you know, I just think it made a few missteps in different areas. I do appreciate that version a lot though. Um there's a lot of good stuff in that one. What about you? What's your favorite version of Kong? I don't know. I guess the an, another conversation to have is like the difference between King Kong himself and the movies he's in. Yes. Um, and that's something that I want to bring up too in terms of the conversation of like, is this a monster movie? Is this a kaiju movie? Because the conclusion that I arrived at is that King Kong himself is a kaiju compared to a monster. However... Whether or not this movie is a kaiju movie, I think is debatable. I think it's on the borderline of it. Um, I think this movie, uh, I guess we should clarify what is the difference between a kaiju movie and a monster movie. For me, I think a lot of it has to do with a sense of like human participation in monstrosity and human mon- like responsibility for monstrosity um, and the damage that it causes. And the reason why Godzilla is the ultimate example of this is because there's a great humility um, that the, you know, the human characters in Godzilla have before this, like, you know, unearthly force that they've never seen before. Um, And this movie doesn't have the same humility, really. That's a, that's he a- wants to treat King Kong as like a noble monster. You know, whereas a monster is someone that's just more of a pure antagonist. A monster movie is a movie like them. Which we've also done on the show, which I love. Like, yeah, it's it's stupid. And like it's one of those 50s movies that I believe Red Letter Media put it of just like there's a lot of boring scenes of people talking. So the teenagers in the drive in theater can make out. But I, I don't know about that distinction, though, because like a lot of the best monsters are reflections of things that we're afraid of that we've created ourselves. But I don't know. It's, it's definitely a predecessor to Kaiju movies and definitely in retrospect, you can more easily apply the Kaiju label to this. And I I think Kaiju is also like become such a heavily commercialized term too, that like it it's, it's interesting. It can become about. limiting, perhaps. Yeah. yeah. And that's the weird thing about this, is that if you want to talk about this as a kaiju movie, the only way you can apply it is retroactively. It's kaiju for a reason. It's because Godzilla is Japanese. Godzilla is the thing that helps create kaiju, right? Yes. Um, and Godzilla is the thing that would make you consider this a kaiju movie, potentially. Otherwise, this is just a monster movie. Kong must be so fucking fed up every time he looks away from this girl for two seconds. She's <laughs> Literally attacked. every time. <laughs> she's getting attacked by a different fucking dinosaur. That's a big ass pterodactyl. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's probably the size of a uh, fucking Quetzalcoatl, but... Yeah, that's true. But that's not what that fucking thing is. No. Too small of a beak. I hope all our listeners know what the Quetzalcoatl... Quetzalcoatlus is. Uh, what an amazing animal. I kind of wish I was alive to see that. Yeah. I, at the same time, I'm glad I'm not, but like... So horrifying. Yeah. I mean, a thing the size of a fucking giraffe that can just... <laughs> Soar through the air. Yeah, except it's got to be way bigger than a giraffe if you actually saw it, right? Because it's as tall as a giraffe, but its wingspan is the size. Of oh, like, yeah. When it's like, I'm saying when it's walking, it's like yeah. the size of a giraffe. But Then like, you see it in the air and it's got to look like, I don't even know what it's got to look like. There's think, just no frame of reference. They think it was a scavenger, though. And like, well, it has to be. Of just like when you can just soar for miles upon miles upon miles, like just wait until you find a dead sauropod and eat that and you can be fine yeah you just like you see the other smaller things really get the fuck out of the way yeah there's no reason not to do that that's a there's so many examples sorry i've been watching too many nature documentaries i was watching one about the ice age 
and how like fucking cave bears, which are bigger than any bears that we have alive today. They were just scavengers because they were so fucking huge. They could just walk up to anything. Yeah, like a like, T-Rex too. Yeah, just fucking walk up to anything and it's just like, oh, this is your kill. No, this is my kill now. What's going to fuck with you? You yeah. know, there's no reason to expend the energy to, to hunt things if you're that large. Smaller things will hunt things and kill them all the time. And then you can just be the beneficiary of that. Uh, that's why the fucking cheetahs, besides us being shitty to cheetahs, like that's one reason that she does have been losing numbers. It's like they expend all this fucking energy going super fast to take down an animal. And then just like hyenas or lions can show up and just be like, what the fuck are you going to do to us? There's a thousand of us. Yeah. Yeah. Not, not even that. Like one bite from a hyena can fuck up a cheetah for life. So like, you're going to risk that. You're going to risk me email never, never being able to. Why is him. that? Do hyenas have like the bacteria bite? No, back hyenas have, I believe the strongest bite strength of any predator. Are you kidding me? Yeah. What, what, like more than a shark or something? Uh, I believe it's around the same as a great white shark. Are you fucking serious? Yeah, it's fucking ridiculous. How is that possible? They have ridiculous bite strength. Is that why they have those weird necks? Yeah. They have those weird neck muscles? Hyenas are so fucking cute, though. They are. It's like weird wolf cat things. Just having a good time, laughing. No, they they have a stronger bite bite strength than the lions. Speaking of which, King Kong's roar is a reversed lion's roar that it was then dropped down an octave or two. They love using lion roars for things like that. Uh, they went to the I think to the L.A. Zoo to try to get some uh, gorilla roars, um, not knowing I guess that gorillas don't really like roar. No, they said they recorded for like hours. Um, the sound guy, Maurice Bivak, was like, yeah, we recorded for hours. Uh, and then the gorillas basically just like ate bananas and like farted. That's all the sounds he got. <laughs> they just were like relaxing. And so he's like, fuck it, we're using a line. It is interesting. It's just so weird to me to think like, like white people didn't know gorillas existed until like 20 years prior to this. All these like black people in Africa are like, yeah, gorillas are a thing, and then white people are like, surely not, a massive ape. Oh, I've never seen. What's one. a silly thing? At least the chickens will be safe. I saw an interesting thing about the depiction of the tribes people that also was a type someone read it as like a type of nostalgia for like plantation lifestyle in the south you have all these black people like living in shacks and everything it's like a recreation of it which was weird yeah i don't know if that's accurate i don't either there's a lot of hidden things in this movie that i'm not sure about like anthropologically and that's like one of the i feel like nowadays that's like one of the clearest ways to try to even engage with this movie is because like it was so fucking monumental immediately right and you look at 1933 and it's like in so many ways just a completely different world it's like how many things were you missing out on in like the connotations of how these things are depicted You know, in some ways, Max, this movie is very similar to Taken. We talked about, like, the threat of violence by, like, uh, using the, like, white female body to justify violence, right? Yeah. But also, it's I think it's, like, a type of, like, at least at this point in time, I think definitely part of the plot of this movie, there's a subtext of um, insecurity and anxiety over, like, female financial independence as gained through sex work. That's an interesting take because they bring it's just so conspicuous to me that they bring it up twice at the beginning and they bring it up in the way they do. You know, it just seems to be making like a like a point. There's a fixation on it, Max. Um, and I guess we can compare it to our Sunrise episode where we talk about the woman from the city in that movie kind of being uh, an expression of a type of uh, anxiety over like 
financially independent flapper women in the 20s. But it is definitively different in this movie um, after the start of the Depression because it's like, it's like, yeah, that is the one way women can make money that men cannot. And there's, of course, that anxiety would be exacerbated during a period in time when so many men are out of work. You know? Yeah. Especially when you consider that the majority of people who must have lost their jobs in the Depression, um, as far as like official records and numbers go, must have been men, right? Because there wouldn't have been as many women in the workforce to begin with. Yeah, it was the same thing. I, I know that's true. Uh, I knew that was true in Germany. And that's one of the things that led to fucking Hitler's rise is trying to restore the masculinity of the German man. Yeah. But, ugh. Well, I obviously, I think the same insecurity would be felt by men in the U.S. Oh, 100%. Yeah. Yeah. You know, like, you know, so you're in this dire situation where people need to survive and women have this way of earning money through sex work that is specific to them alone. Or just being financially independent. A lot of times women weren't laid off because they were paid less in the first place. That too. That's another possibility. So women would be working jobs while men didn't have any fucking like anything to do. Yeah. So, and also, yeah, like the, the financially independent, like flapper women in general from that time period were a threat to men in general. And I think there's still that attitude, especially early on in the film with him just like dismissing the idea of a getting a woman who's strong enough to yeah go on this voyage. And it's like, ah, oh, we need a flapper in the pick. We need a woo woo. Yeah. Let me throw my fucking Acme brand gas grenades. <laughs> yes. No, but it is interesting you bring that up, Max, because it makes me think about like what it is about like Ann Darrow as a character that makes her so much uh, uh, like a desired object of exchange. And it is her passivity inherently. And that's what's defined as like femininity and beauty in this movie, right? Is that passivity and the ability to be exchanged is what defines the woman. They got him. Now, Max, I just want to ask, now that we're about to uh, journey back to New York, uh, what wh- you thought Godzilla was going to win in Godzilla vs. Kong, correct? Yes. And you were team Godzilla. Yes. All right. I just wanted to clear that up. Now, on the in the film Baragon versus Frankenstein, <laughs> who would win that battle? Uh, Frankenstein, because Baragon is a piece of shit. What a, what a you t- don't like Baragon? The Godzilla one? No, no, the Baragon one, Max. No, Baragon, not Barugan. Uh, not Barugan. That's that's it's very different. Very very different. <laughs> that's Gamera. Yes. Now Baragon fucking sucks. Um, Why? <laughs> He's what a boring design for a kaiju. He's just he's just not interesting. I say is my favorite kaiju is Mothra, but still, Mothra is beautiful though. She is. These tickets cost me twenty bucks. That's enough for a house back in this time, basically. As far as I know, though, the Baragon versus Frankenstein movie was the only solo Baragon movie, so. At least you've got that going in your favor. But I don't know, I kind of like Baragon. I mean, they're stupid, but it's fine. Also, he's never tried to break free before. King Kong? Yeah. No, never. But now, Max, we have the parallels arriving once again. There's so many parallels in this movie. And again, one of them is uh, King Kong is now subdued and can be uh, displayed for an audience in the same way that Ann Darrow was. Yeah. For him. Oh, how the turntables turn. Isn't it crazy? Now, Max, would you go see King Kong? That's the real question. No, I, I want to say I would, but like, 
having been to circuses when I was younger and seeing like animals just being mistreated, it's it's just like sleepwalking. Yeah, it it really like any sense of wonder you have is like sucked out immediately. Yeah, I have to I have to confess like I appreciate the conservation work that like zoos do. I would yeah. never want to go to a zoo. It's different if you're like in the house of reptiles because you're like this tree frog. He doesn't know. He's yeah, just vibing. Yeah, this tree frog is going to be okay in like just a decent spot like size terrarium. Yeah. But like I don't want to see like fucking wildebeest or like elephants bears or, shit. or something. Yeah, it's just depressing as hell. Especially primates. Yeah, there is like I know like the Cincinnati Zoo has like a gigantic fucking enclosure for their hippos. Like it's just their thing, but both like above ground and below ground mm-hmm. for water. But like it, it really depends and you can't just shove any animal in any zoo. But Yeah, that's part of why it is so hard to uh, have some of these animals breed in captivity is because they don't fucking like captivity Yeah, and they're not going to breed in captivity because they're fundamentally just uncomfortable. So it's just not going to work. <laughs> I'm not going to tell you their names, though, because fuck them. <laughs> oh, man. That would be a bummer, and I want you to enjoy seeing this gigantic fucking monkey I brought back. But they'll turn it into a joke in the 2005 one. They're like, we'll donate the proceeds to his family. Guy who died. You remember this? Oh, yeah, and they keep, he keeps going with yeah. it. Goddamn Jenkins. <laughs> we'll donate the proceeds to his family. Yeah, I got to say, I wouldn't see this. Um, mostly because, like, I don't know what's supposed to happen now, now that you've seen him. When are they going to crucify him? What's going to happen? <laughs> Is he going to sing a song? Or are we going to do, like, a performance? Yeah, why did he take the top hat off? He had, like, the big showman top hat when he was talking to the press back there, and now he took it off. I'm, I'm disappointed about that. He had the top hat on, and I believe he was going to do, like, a little tap dancing number with the cane. King Kong? Yes. That's obviously what I meant. Well, I'm just saying that, like, you got to give me something here. I saw the giant monkey. I get it. Yeah, like, you think that you'd have him doing things like, look how strong he is. We're going to have him lift an entire automobile. But no, they just have him there. Look, it's a monkey. Let's see how far we he can throw a truck or something. Yeah. I think they would have him, like, Coney Island or something. But, like, no, we're going to have him in the middle of Broadway. I guess this is just a big unveiling. Maybe it's only 30 minutes. But then why would you go to a big Broadway thing for 30 minutes? I don't know. I don't know. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna nitpick all the the intricacies of how he would do this. Ding. I'm not a showman. I'm not I'm not as smart as Carl Denham. He's a bona fide huckster. God damn. What you know what though, Max? Compared to other kaiju movies, this movie makes me so much more sad about, like, extinct megafauna. Yeah. Because you know what this movie has that other kaiju movies do not have? Despite its intentions, I think, is that it so much more clearly, like, depicts, like, a such a, like, explicit relationship of exploitation. Like, look at these close-ups we're getting of the bulbs, right? It's there to explain why he's freaking out, because he's scared of the bulbs. But also, it's like, you how can you not feel a, like a fundamental level of pathos with King Kong? Well, yeah, and that's another thing that Peter Jackson expanded on, because I think, like, re-watching it now, like, that's a thing modern audiences feel immediately. Yeah, you got to care about King Kong more than these people. Whoever that guy was, I'm sure he deserves to be eaten. (laughs) Fuck him. He doesn't taste good.
<laughs> Shut your windows, girl. Oh, man. <laughs> She's not going to shut her window, is she? No. Oh, no. Oh, yeah. Some cops and motorcycles. That will do it. That'll do it. You got to get those uh, rollerblade cops that went viral last year. This it's- might be a stretch, Max, but there's something about this movie, too, that I think is still live in the culture in like a very perhaps negative way, which is like a fetishization of like racialized violence. Do you know what I mean? Like there's just like, I'm specifically thinking of like over the last five or six years, just the sheer like repetitiveness and like uh, frequency with which you just see videos of like, you know, black people being harassed by cops or assaulted or worse. Right. You know, like, it just repeatedly over and over and over again. There's like this weird spectacle of like violence against them. It appears, I think, in like news discourse. And I wonder if there's something up to that that's just like present in the type of like mainstream American psyche going back at least as far as 1933. I mean, farther than that. Sure. Like, yeah, and at the same time, this is like one of the most iconic scenes in movie history is Kong fucking climbing the Empire State Building. But. Yeah, at the same time, when he's about to take her out of the... I mean, it's kind of silly Yes, to look at it now. But, uh, you know, him taking her out... This is, this is the racist trope, right? Oh, yeah. The black man climbing in through the window. This is the same thing that people will talk about with Frankenstein, too, when he climbs in through the window. No, and it's like if, if any of our audience have ever subjected, themse- subjected themselves to watching Birth of a Nation... It's a very similar vibe of just like this monstrous other coming in and taking white women and yeah, the home invader. Yes, yeah. And I'm not trying to like birth of a nation in particular. Like literally, just makes yeah black people monsters. That's just the entire point of the movie. Yeah. Disgusting film. Don't subject yourself to it if you don't have to. But there's there's no need to. Um, also because if you wanted to explore the like works of D.W. Griffith, Griffith and his contributions to filmmaking, there's many other films he made aside from that one. No, and like it's one of those things I used to be of the mindset that like I have to watch something in order to like fully understand and, and dismiss it. It's so it. long. It's so long. I even read the book it was based on because I had to do a project on it in high school. Oh, that's terrible. Yeah. The book is I would say the book is more subtle in its racism until the end. Like it, it holds its cards closer to its chest until it's ready to go full fucking Klansman. <laughs> um, like it's still abundantly racist for the first 90% of the book, but like it's not maybe cause you just don't have the visual element of people in blackface the entire time, but it's still, it's still abhorrent, but it's like Lenny Riefenstahl where it's like, don't read about why it's important and look up a couple of reference photos. I don't know. I think fundamentally, you could do whatever the fuck you want. True. But for me, like, like, I'm just not interested in watching Birth of a Nation. No, <laughs> it's, it's not none. worth it. I would, yeah. I would not recommend it to people. It's like, what am I going to gain from this? I just watch a different D.W. Griffith movie. I, he made other fucking movies. No, and that that mindset got me nowhere. I read all of Atlas Shrugged in high school to try to... What a waste. That's so embarrassing I know, to admit. Right? Like, I could have done anything yeah, with my time that would have been better with it that. It is so embarrassing to read Atlas Shrugged. It really is. <laughs> Even if you're in high school. <laughs> I told you. I think I've told mentioned this on the podcast before, but I had a, I once dated somebody, and their dad, like, collected first editions of books and whatever. Yeah. And they had a first edition signed copy of Atlas Shrugged. Signed. And they used it to prop up the toilet in the back. Hey, there you go. Well, how'd they get it? They got it at some fucking bookstore or something. I forget how, or they inherited it from a relative or something, but like that's what it was used for was to prop up the toilet in their bathroom. Yeah. Uh, if you listeners, if you haven't read any, um, Ayn Rand, her writing is also terrible. It's not like the book is good. Um, her books are terrible. No, it's just, yeah, it's bland and boring and it's just all because she takes it. She takes 
these things too seriously. She takes these like gifted individuals like they're well because it's not so fucking it's seriously. not good fiction and it's not good philosophy is the yeah. problem if it was one or the other like you could, i could be like okay i understand it's boring it's irritating it's written by someone who's so much more stupid than they think they are um yeah those books suck i'd like to see how her fucking stupid ass architect deals with king kong Tell me how you're going to su- solve this problem now with your superior intellect, you stupid asshole. By asking the government for money to repair it because... <laughs> because you're owed money yes. or whatever. Because I'm great and you're not. Fuck you. People asking for money from the government is leeching off society except when I do it because fuck you. Well, because you deserve it. Yes. Yeah. That's why it wasn't hypocritical that Ayn Rand was collecting social security up until the day she died. That, by the way... Just as a complete tangent, that's one of the weirdest discoveries I think we've made on the show is those like subtext of Ayn Rand shit in Men in Black. Yeah. Where it's like, oh, they really have just it's like just baked into the American psyche at this point, though. It's like the idea of American capitalism is so inseparable from Randyism that like it's especially just... the conspiratorial part of it. There's yeah. like the fundamental part of like Randianism where it's like it. It relies on the idea of like exceptional individuals doing all One this shit. One of our most cringiest senators is named after Ayn Rand, so like it's fucking, ugh, it's definitely still there. Rand Paul is named after Ayn Rand. You didn't know that? No. Yeah, Ron Paul. I thought he was just. Ron Paul named his kid after Ayn Rand. Him. Yeah. Wow, that's terrible. <laughs> I'm glad I was able to share that with you. Well, he's a scumbag, so I don't really care. Oh no, he's he's the worst. I uh, love this scale, though. Yeah, look at this Empire State Building. They do an amazing job with the scale in this movie. It's it's consistent the entire time for Kong. Like he pointed out, the Empire State Building. I don't think it's this big. But. So Max, one of the things I wanted to talk about this entire time was, you know, what what ultimately it, does this racism accomplish for this movie? What does it do with um, like what need in the audience or what desire in the audience is it speaking to? Um, obviously I think there's a, uh, a fear of the other, I would say, and a reinforcement of the fact that as much as the spectacle of the other might be intriguing to us, it is better for us all to stay separate and leave them where they belong because well, you say stay separate. And I think that's the that's the thread I sort of started to pull on. And yeah. I started to think that maybe this is more of a depression movie than you might originally occur to you. Um, because it doesn't seem to address things like economics or money explicitly for a great deal of its runtime. But it does have those moments in the beginning. And I think the more I started to think about it, it was like, this movie is kind of like naturalizing the brutality that people are experiencing in the depression into the natural world. Right. Yeah. Where it is substituting that where it's like, this is not a, a crisis and a horrific experience for everyone that is perpetuated by a specific economic system perpetuated by, uh, you know, a government that's enabling people to, to, uh, you know, enact like predatory, uh, capitalist tendencies, um, that then come back and bite you in the ass. It's not that it's a condition of the natural world. Right. Yeah. And I think Andero being a commodity and an object of exchange in both Manhattan and Skull Island is a big part of that because it Andero is the link. He uses her and the exchange of her body as the thing that seals the deal saying that like, yes, you're going to be an object of exchange in both locations. Right. Ooh. I love this. This is, I mean, I know we were having a very heavy conversation about race, but like, this is why we watch this movie. This, this scene is still one of the most iconic, like blockbuster scenes in all of film. Yeah. And like, I did it's just the weird pathos of it. Like, like, I know it's totally not intentional, but like, it's like, I just see violence against like a non-white being, you know, I didn't like in in, like a type of like policing. That's like really weird and effective to me. 
they're just shooting him. You know, it's like it's not his fucking fault that he's here. And no, we're not the first ones to read the racial context. Yeah. Of Kong himself. It's just like, yeah. and even if you don't want to, because you're annoyed by that shit, which in which case, why are you listening to our podcast? But like, I think it's viscerally upsetting in general to just see like a fucking animal be shot and then reach for somebody he cares about and then die. Well, the thing is, Max, is that it's the same mechanism of response. Yeah. Which should go to show you exactly how like black people are treated in this fucking country. It's because you would treat them the same way you might treat like fucking King Kong, you know? And it's ridiculous. Like, uh, that's why it works in that way is the only reason it works for that is because black people are already going to be treated as like this thing in between humans and animals and in the real world, which is, yeah, it's fucking disgusting. Yeah. So that's why it, it works. And that's why that connection and that pathos, um, you, you want to make that connection because that's just like true to life. And you don't have to, you don't have to like quote unquote bring race into it to even like end up making that connection because it's like, yeah, that is just how it's, this sort of thing is responded to. Oh, he just got there. <laughs> Good set of lungs on that guy. <laughs> I assume he didn't take the elevator. Well, they invented elevators. When were elevators invented? I think they were. Probably way sooner. Than yeah, no, in the 1800s, I yeah. believe. But they, I believe they were, a lot of times it was just like human-operated elevators. But <laughs> this is the scene where he's like, let me through, I'm Carl Denham. Like, oh, you should be arrested. This is your monkey? Why, yes, it is. So you're responsible for all the people he killed. Okay, off to prison with you. <laughs> nope, not off to prison. Dun, dun, dun. And I do like in the Peter Jackson one how they play up how corny that fucking ending line is. Yeah. And they play up, I don't know, there's more of a sense that he's, like, fucked and over yeah. in that one. Um, in this one, he sort of gets the definitive last word. And that's kind of the thing about this movie and why it's interesting to look at King Kong kind of, like, transcending it is because it's, like, King Kong kind of, like, fighting this battle against, against Carl Denham. And even though he d dies in this movie, he sort of succeeds in the long run. King Kong does escape and win in, like, a more meta way. He, you know, in the sense that he escapes this movie, he becomes this big cultural thing, and Carl Denham doesn't really succeed in controlling and manipulating him. King Kong is always going to be out there rampaging and, like, destroying cities because we love King Kong. We don't love Carl Denham. Yes. So that's that's the big thing that I also feel about this movie. So, yeah. So, yeah, maybe we'll come back. We'll do Son of Kong. We'll do... Uh, the 76 we're, King Kong. We're doing Beast of Hollow Mountain before we do Son, Son of Kong because ugh, Son of Kong is not great. But if you, no. want, if you want to hear us talk about movies that are great, you can listen to some of our other episodes on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher. We're also starting to upload our episodes to YouTube if you prefer to listen to podcasts there. And uh, we're going to try getting back on a regular schedule. So we have plenty of more content for you guys to look forward Spectator to. Spectatorfilmpodcast.com that is also where you can find our stuff. Any last words, Austin? Uh, no. Okay, then die. <laughs>